Yes, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, the first witness this morning is Mrs. Rao from APRA. Yes, Mrs. Rao in the hearing room. Can I ask you to come into the witness box and before you settle down and sit down, can I ask first whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An affirmation. Yes, then affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, will be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Dick. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. M Mrs. Rowell, is your full name Helen Rowell? It is. And um, is your current uh, business address? the APRA offices at 1 Martin Place, Sydney, New South Wales. That's correct. Um, and could you um, inform the Commissioner of your current position in, at APRA? I'm the Deputy Chairman of APRA. Um, and have you received a summons to appear at this round of hearings of the Commission? I have. Um, and do you have that summons with you? I do. I attend to that. Uh, 5.297, the summons to Mrs Rowell. Uh, Mrs. Rao, you've prepared a witness statement for this round of hearings. I have. Um, and that's a statement dated the 14th of August 2018. Uh, yes, I believe so. And you have the original of that statement with you? I do. Um, now, could you just turn to paragraph 50 of the statement, please? Yes. Do you see in the second uh, line of paragraph 50 there's a there's a barcode reference for a document there. I do. And there's a change that uh, you wish to make to that. I do, yes. And if I could just read on to the, the record that the correct uh, reference should be um, 007.0007.0001. Uh, yes. Is that correct? Yes. A and then could you turn to... Just, uh, do you mind making the change and amending it, uh, amending it and initialing it? Yes. Yes. What I'm struggling to say. Um, and then, uh, Mrs. Rao, could you turn to para 128 of your statement? Yes. And there's a reference there to um, uh, a date, 2014. Yes. And does that, that need to be changed? It needs to be changed to 2017. And could you make that change and initial it, please? Yes. Um, now, with those corrections, yes. um, are the contents of your statement true and correct to the best of your belief? They are. Um, Commissioner, I tend to the statement and uh, the exhibit. The statement and exhibits to the statement of Mrs. Rowell of 14 August 18 is exhibit 5.298. Thank you. And Mrs. Rowell, do you also have a working copy of your statement and exhibit? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dick. Yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mrs. Rao, I want to start by just asking you some questions so that we can understand or help the Commission to understand the way in which APRA approaches the regulation of the superannuation industry. Yes. APRA has prudential responsibility in relation to areas other than superannuation. APRA has prudential responsibility for banking and uh, insurance and superannuation. And in relation to superannuation, does it take a different approach to that which it adopts in relation to banking and insurance? In a general sense, no. Uh, we adopt a similar regulatory philosophy and supervision uh, philosophy across all of our industries. There are some nuances according to the specific legislation. And is the way APRA describes its approach to prudential regulation one that is principles-based and risk-based? That's correct. And I think you explain, and we might bring it up, at page two of your statement. Page two, paragraph 24. 
that the way you would describe principles based <coughs> is to give emphasis to the achievement of sound prudential outcomes in setting regulatory requirements and expectations without necessarily seeking to specify or prescribe the exact manner in which those outcomes must be achieved. That's correct. Could you just explain a little more to us about that? Is the way in which you set out the principles base, is the way in which you set out the principles base for entities through the prudential standards that you issue? That's correct. So in general terms, the relevant industry legislative acts set out quite high level requirements and the uh, APRA principal uh, prudential standards elaborate on those high level requirements to um, set, in essence, principles based objectives that would support the achievement of what's in the law. How does principle based standards relate to the idea of legislative prescriptions on certain behaviour? There, the, there's um, a, a consistency, I think, in, in that if you if you meet the principles that are set out in the in the principles based standards, if you achieve the objective um, of the of the prudential standards, then you would be expected to also then meet the legislative obligation that has been prescribed. And so, to take if we move from prescriptions to proscriptions. If there's a proscription in the legislation on doing something that is other than for the sole purpose of maintaining retirement benefits, is that something that, from APRA's perspective, is ultimately achieved by following the principles that are set out in the prudential guides or standards? Well, it, it can be. I think um, you need to look to both the legislation and the prudential standards to determine whether the obligations of any individual entities are, are being met. And if APRA takes the view that a particular entity isn't achieving or following the principles that are set out in a prudential guide, what is the action that it would take? It would depend on the, on the specifics of the circumstances um, and, the, and the issue at hand. We have a range of actions that we can take from heightened supervision through to specific administrative actions like appointment of uh, experts to do a, 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 an in-depth review uh, through to uh, issuing um, requirements through supervisory letters for a matter to be addressed and ultimately through to potentially taking uh, legal uh, action if that is warranted by the seriousness of the matter. And when you say taking legal action, can you take legal action because an entity isn't achieving the principles that are set out in a prudential standard? It, it's very hard to answer that in a general way. It is, um, again, it depends on um, what the particular matter and issue at hand is, and also there are a range of actions available to APRA under the law, and the triggers for exercising those vary according to the specific piece of um, provision of the legislation that is relevant. Perhaps if I put the question in a different way, is it ever possible for APRA to say an entity, a superannuation entity, has contravened a prudential standard? Uh, that is possible. And if APRA says that an entity has contravened a prudential standard, what are the consequences that can follow from that under the legislation? Again, it would depend on the, on the particular um, matter. Uh, the, in general terms, we would be able to direct the institution to comply with the um, prudential standard. Um, but again, the, whether we would do that or whether we would take some other action would depend on the circumstances. Our primary focus is uh, trying to achieve the objective of the legislation and protect the interests of members. If we take as an example the fit and proper prudential standard, and maybe yes. you've exhibited that to your statement, so if we bring up... this is. Exhibit HR 
1-3 to Mrs Rao's statement and the relevant standard is at APRA.007.0005.0267. Have you got that there, I, Mrs. I have, yes. Thank you. And so we see at the beginning that what's explained is the prudential standard sets out minimum requirements for RSE licensees in determining the fitness and propriety of individuals to hold positions of responsibility. Yes. Now, this is a standard that would be or is or was drafted by APRA. That's correct. And is this the standard that would set out the principles in relation to fitness and propriety. Yes. And then if we go to page dot zero two six eight. Yes. In paragraph six. Yes. And we see that there's a requirement that an RSE licensee have a fit and proper policy. Yes. And if a if an entity didn't have a fit and proper policy, assuming that occurred, what is it that APRA could do in that event? Well, we would require them to establish a fit and proper policy. And is that a power that you have under the Act to give a direction to them to do so? I believe so. And then if they didn't do it, what would happen? Uh, I, I'm not a lawyer. I understand that we would be able to take some sort of legal enforcement action. And if we then go over to page dot zero two seven one. Yes. And this is setting out what the criteria are to determine if a responsible person is fit and proper. Yeah. And it appears to be perhaps reflecting what's in the CIS Act, expressed at a very general level. Uh, that's correct. And if an entity's criteria for assessing a fit and proper person was inadequate, then APRA could do something? Uh, yes, we would be able to, um, again, depending on the level of deficiency, either recommend that they make improvements to their particular policy or if we felt that it was completely adequate, that would be a stronger requirement for them to do so. And then if we go to page dot zero two seven three. Yes. This sets out the process for assessment of fitness and propriety. Yes. And the fit and proper policy has to contain a process for determining whether or not I'm sorry, has to contain a process for applying the fit and proper policy? That's correct. And needs to explain how it is that the RSE licensee is going to go about determining whether somebody is fit and proper? That's correct. And if the statement, I'm sorry, if the fit and proper policy didn't contain adequate provisions for determining whether somebody was fit and proper, or an adequate process, then what is it that APRA would do? It would be the same. We would um, recommend or require changes according to the degree of deficiency that we felt was uh, uh, inherent in the policy or process. And so all of these things take us through the development of a process and the embodiment of a process and the embodiment of a criteria. Yes. And then when it comes to the question of is a person fit and proper, a question that presumably must be asked on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. how does APRA go about dealing with that question? Well, the requirement to determine whether someone is fit and proper actually rests with the RSE licensee that has to implement their policy and, and apply the process in their policy. And so APRA would undertake supervision activity um, and, and uh, review how the trustee was uh, doing that on an ongoing basis as part of our regular supervision activity. And in the course of that supervision activity, 
the supervisor might also come to a view that it was possible that a responsible person was not fit and proper? Uh, that is possible. And if that was to occur, what would happen? Uh, the first step that we would take would be to engage with the RSE licensee to uh, ask them how they had determined that the individual was fit and proper and what was the criteria and the decision-making process and do uh, documentation of that process. And um, that may satisfy us that an appropriate process and criteria had been followed. If it had not, then we would pro uh, probably um, recommend or, again, require, depending on the circumstances, that the RSE licensee perhaps consider undertaking a another assessment, looking at other factors, and uh, reassess its view. What if APRA formed the view that somebody was not fit and proper? What would happen then? Uh, I think our, our first recourse would be to um, engage with the RSC licensee to um, endeavour to get them to take action to determine um, whether the person really was fit and proper or not. If we were not satisfied with that outcome, then uh, again, ultimately, we may want to pursue other avenues uh, to, to address that. One of the problems one might think with engaging with the licensee about whether somebody is fit and proper is that the person you are engaging with at the licensee is the person that you think isn't fit and proper. Do you agree? Uh, very hard to generalise about that and, and there are a number of people that um, uh, fit and proper assessments are relevant to. Um, we would, um, you know, obviously engage with a different individual in respect of um, the assessment and the issues um, rather than the individual concerned. So, um, you know, if it's one of the directors, we would engage with the chair of the board. If it's the CEO, we would engage with the, with the, with the chair of the board. Um, if it's the chair of the board, we would probably engage with the deputy chair. So, or if it's another responsible person in management, we would, we would engage with whoever we felt was the appropriate person to have that engagement with. And if after you've engaged and engaged, there is not an adequate response from the RSE licensee. What is the next step for APRA? Uh, assuming we were um, contemplating taking more formal action, we would um, likely issue a, a show cause notice as to why we shouldn't take that particular action and set out in that show cause notice what our concerns were and what we thought the appropriate action to be taken was in response to those concerns. And a show cause notice, is that a formal document under the Act? It is. And what happens if you get a response back which says, we think this person is fit and proper or we're just not going to change? Well, ultimately, if we're talking about a fit and proper, then we would need to apply to the court. So the show cause notice in a fit and proper where we felt that someone was not fit and proper and should be removed would be to have that person disqualified, I think, would be the ultimate action. And then we would need to apply to the court to have that action pursued. And you've only had to apply to the court since 2008? Uh, that's correct. Before 2008, between I think February 2003 and 2008, you were able to administratively disqualify somebody on the basis that they weren't fit and proper? That's correct. And during that five year period, APRA administratively disqualified, was it 133? It was around about that number, yes. People as not being fit and proper. Mm -hmm. And Since 2008, when it's been necessary to apply to the court, APRA's applied once to the court to disqualify somebody? That's correct. And that was one of the directors of TRIO Capital? That's correct. And that was resolved by an enforceable undertaking being given by that person That's not correct. to continue to be a responsible person? That's correct. And there were another 12, in addition to that one director, I think there are another 12 directors or 
people associated with Trio Capital that gave enforceable undertakings? That's correct. And are there other enforceable undertakings that APRA has obtained since 2008 from...? Not in relation to superannuation, as I understand it. OK. I think if I can just add some context to the, to the pre and post 2008 change, a significant proportion of those 130 uh, disqualifications were part of an exercise we undertook when changes to the law were introduced in 2004 that required relicensing of all superannuation entities and we undertook what we called the Lost and Lazy program, where if we were unable to get a response from the trustees um, in relation to an, uh, uh, a superannuation entity and could not get them to satisfactorily complete the relicensing process, then we disqualified them through an, that administrative process. Uh, so that was a, a, a large portion of those uh, administrative decisions. Are you aware of whether APRA has turned its mind in the last, let's say, three years to the question of whether any particular individual is a fit and proper person at a superannual, at an RSE licensee? There have been a number of uh, matters that have been um, raised with particular entities and individuals at those entities around uh, some behaviour that we were not uh, happy with, um, which leads to the uh, discussions internally about uh, the nature of the behaviour and the concern, the, the seriousness of it and what the appropriate action is. Um, uh, I... Um, in general terms, that does raise questions about, um, you know, considerations of fitness and propriety. Um, I, uh, so I, I guess we would have turned our minds to that in a general sense in some cases. Is one of the concerns that APRA has about having to apply to the court for a disqualification order the cost involved in that? Uh, that is a consideration. I think our primary consideration, and, and certainly when we're considering uh, enforceable undertakings versus uh, disqualification proceedings, firstly, the outcome that we're seeking to achieve, particularly specifically in the case of fit and proper actions, is ultimately the removal of the industry for uh, the removal of the industry uh, individual from a responsible person role in the industry for a period that we think is appropriate. And we can typically use enforceable undertakings to achieve that outcome in a more cost efficient and timely way with more certainty than would be the case with going through a court proceeding. Other than in the case of the TRIO Capital Directors, have you sought an enforceable undertaking from an individual in the last 10 years that would, if they'd agreed to give it, have prevented them from acting as a responsible person? As far as I'm aware, no, um, but we have had um, individuals, uh, the, the RSE licensee themselves have taken steps to remove individuals at APRA's in in instigation uh, in that period, which has achieved the outcome that we were trying to seek or would have sought through an impossible undertaking, if needed. If we go to page 45 of your statement, paragraph 298. Yes. You said out there, or you're considering there, I might just wait, I'm sorry, Mrs. Rowell, until it comes up on the screen. There we go. You were asked a question by the Commission to explain any practical limitations or impediments on APRA mm -hmm. seeking disqualification orders pursuant to Section 126, capital H of the CIS Act. Yes. And at paragraph 298, you're setting out your answer to that. Yes. And the first is, the first impediment is the resources and expense of gathering sufficient and, admi and admissible evidence in the form that would be required by a court. Yes. And 
you make the point APRA does not have power to recoup costs of an investigation. Yes. And then if we go over the page to page 46, the second point you make is about the legal costs of the court process. Yes. And then the third point is about the length of time involved with court processes. Yes. Can I ask you about this? I'm both you and ASIC, when I say you, I mean APRA, tend to raise as an issue that court processes take a long time. What is the basis of that judgment? Um, our previous experience in dealing with matters through um, relevant tribunals such as the AAT and obs observation of other uh, court processes that occur in the wider um, financial sector. In terms of your experiences in dealing with courts, as far as we understand it, APRA hasn't had any experience with dealing with courts in the last 10 years, has it? <coughs> Uh, I'm not sure that is strictly correct, um, but I'd, I'd need In the to, superannuation in space? In the superannuation space, yes. I mean, okay. obviously there are other APRA industries where we have had different actions uh, and issues. And when you talk about administrative tribunals, you're talking about a situation where pre-2008 you made an administrative decision to disqualify a person and then they sought a review of that decision in the AAT? Yes. And your observation was it took some period of time for that review to be resolved? Typically did, yes. And it, there were reviews on a number of occasions or a number of decisions, is that and, right? And that's correct, yes. And is there some comparison that is done internally based on that now somewhat historical experience? and how long it takes APRA now in its attempts to, I think, I, I'm gonna use the word harass, I don't mean that in a negative way, but to sort of harass the entities to try to make changes by themselves to determine that it's quicker to just keep harassing the entities rather than going to a court? I, I think our, our general view would be that, um, I mean, I, I don't know that we've done any specific detailed analysis of relative time, et cetera. Um, we make an overall assessment based on a number of factors of which time is one, cost is one, but more importantly, what is the outcome that we are seeking to achieve and how best can we achieve that outcome in an efficient and timely manner? And typically when you're talking about fit and proper issues, you want the person removed from their role as quickly as possible. The other thing I want to suggest to you in relation to removing somebody on the basis that they're not fit and proper is that that would be really the most extreme step that you could take in relation to the regulation of an entity. That's correct. Um, I mean, there are, there's disqualification, there's replacement of trustees, there's uh, removal of licence. I mean, they're all quite extreme. Uh, the hurdles for That's taking right, yeah, those actions are really quite high and also we have to have a demonstrable and clear proof that there has been a contravention of the law rather than a view that there may be or could be a contravention of the law. And I should be more clear about this. What I mean is if you approach things on the basis of the regulatory pyramid, which yes. many regulators would use, disqualification of a person would be at the very peak of the pyramid. That's correct. That would be regarded as a form of incapacitating an entity or a person. Correct. And so you would expect that it would not be frequent that APRA would seek to apply to disqualify somebody. That's correct. Now, if we consider another standard which is the conflicts of interest standard. Yes. And you've also exhibited that to your statement. If we go again to exhibit HR 1-3 page, 
It's APRA.0007.0005.0281. Yes. And this is a standard, I think the essence of which is embodied just in the objectives that are set out in the grey box on the front for RSE licensees to establish processes and policies in relation to managing conflicts of interest. That's correct. And the standard requires them to have a conflicts management policy. Yes. And that that be approved by the board. Yes. <coughs> and that they make sure they identify all the relevant duties and relevant interests. Yes. And that they have registers where they record what their duties and interests are. That's correct. And are those what APRA would regard as the principles that then have to be applied by the entity? Uh, yes, although there is a little bit more detail set out in the standard itself about what we would um, expect to be taken into account in establishing those uh, uh, policies and identifying the interests and duties. And it seems as if an RSE licensee can comply with this standard by making sure it has a detailed policy and making sure it has a detailed register and that in that register it's identified all of the interests, is that right? Uh, in broad terms, yes, although we would also expect there to be... Um, uh, uh, um, we would have a view as to whether a policy or a process and the identification of interests and duties was sufficient or adequate in order to meet the intent of the legislation. Yes. Again, that's talking about what is the adequacy of the process or policy that is recorded. Yes. That is distinct from the application of the process and the outcome of the process. Well, both are relevant. To assessing whether the original process is adequate or not. Yes. And if you think about AMP, are you familiar at all with the processes in relation to AMP? Not in detail, no. All right. I'll Let me ask you some questions and we'll see whether or not this can, we can usefully explore this or not. Do you know whether AMP's processes and policies are regarded as adequate by APRA? I believe we have undertaken some reviews of those uh, policies, in fact, um, uh, Yes, we have undertaken reviews and we have um, made observations about where those policies and processes could be strengthened. I think if we bring up APRA.0004.0001.4034, is that a document that's in my pack? No, no. it's not, Mrs. Rao. So this is an email dated the 30th of January 2018 and it has an attachment to it which we'll bring up as well which is APRA.0004.0001.4038. So on the right hand side of the screen we have the letter from APRA to the Senior Manager of Trustee Governance at the two AMP trustees dated the 30th of January 2017 which is concerned with a review of the business monitoring model. Yes. And I'm assuming you probably don't know exactly what the business monitoring model I have a general is. understanding of, of the fact that that model is used by AMP. I don't know the model in detail. And there are some comments that APRA has made about the adequacy of the BMM model back in the beginning of 2017. 
Yes. And then if you look on the left hand side. <coughs> yes. We see there's an email back from Ms. Sultana, trustee governance, indicating that how it is that AMP has responded to those review items. And then you see the response from APRA on the 30th of January 2018 is please find it attached a letter confirming that APRA effectively considers these items closed. Yes. And what I'm trying to understand is <coughs> there is a policy that AMP has in place that APRA seems to be now content with. But at a more fundamental level, the trustee has entirely handed over control of the trust to other AMP group entities. Are you aware of that? Uh, I am. I'm not sure that our understanding of the way the relationship between the trustee and the uh, AMP group works is uh, would be appropriately characterised in that way. What do you mean by that? What is your understanding of how the group works? So there is a trustee board, there is a, an office of the trustee and they are charged with oversighting the operations of the RSE licensee. They outsource a number of the services um, and activities to the AMP group and that there are processes in place to manage those relationships and review and monitor those relationships. There will always be a question as to how robust those processes are and how effective they're operating in practice. Uh, we would continually review our uh, satisfaction or otherwise with those processes as new information comes to light. Um, and so this particular correspondence, I'm assuming, relates to some specific issues that were identified as part of a review activity looking at a particular number of aspects of that process and agreeing that those specific recommendations had been addressed rather than necessarily expressing an overall view that the, the model and the process was adequate and would remain adequate into the future. So our assessment is always evolving based on the information that is coming to hand. And how does APRA assess, if at all, what's going on with the outsource providers? Uh, so we would take an un a number of supervision activities with any individual entity, and I'm not talking about any specific entity here. Um, we would engage with the board to ask them and, and um, review the material that goes to the board about how, what is the information they set, receive, is it adequate, um, does it, uh, is it comprehensive enough, H how do they um, review and challenge what's being provided to them, what other sources of information do they get. We would engage with the senior management on a regular basis to understand the relationship, for example, between, say, an office of trustee and the business and what monitoring and oversight and, and challenge. So um, through um, you know, regular engagement, review of material, engagement with the board, uh, deep dive reviews into particular aspects of the operation of, of the entity to try and get a sense of what are the policies and frameworks and how effectively are those policies and frameworks embedded in practice? And what is the ultimate outcome that APRA is seeking to achieve? Uh, the prudent and robust management of the trust under the RSC licensee in the best interests of members. If you look at, or if we bring up your statement on page three, <coughs> yes. And this perhaps then ties us into the second part of APRA's regulatory approach, which is the risk based approach. Yes. And so the principles are then concerned with or then implemented or reviewed as part of this risk-based approach? Yes. And the risk-based approach is designed 
to identify and assess those areas of greatest risk to a regulated entity or to the financial system as a whole and then apply APRA's supervisory resources and attention to these risks in a targeted and cost-effective manner. Yes. And then you see in paragraph 26, you say, overall, as the prudential regulator, APRA seeks to promote financial system safety and stability by ensuring that regulated entities are prepared to and demonstrate their commitment to operate and manage their risks and assets prudently so as to be able to meet their financial promises to, in the superannuation context, their members. Yes. Now, on its face, what that seems to suggest is that APRA is concerned with the stability of the system and the entities within the system as its primary focus. Do you agree with that? That's not our, our view. I mean, I can see why that might be an interpretation, but I think ultimately the, the objective is that last set of words, which is about, in the superannuation context, meeting financial promises to members. If you don't have a prudently well-managed institution, such as a trustee with its RSEs, then they're not going to be able to meet their promises and their obligations to members. Can we take an example? APRA, as we understand it, regards Neulis, the NAB trustee, as a well-functioning trustee? Um, I would say we would have a view that, that they have um, operated reasonably soundly on a, in, in a general sense. You're aware there is some evidence that has been given during the Royal Commission that a NAB entity, I'm sorry, I should go back, that pre-1 pre July 2016, a predecessor trustee, MLC nominees, mm -hmm. invested all of the assets of the trust into investment-linked insurance policies issued by another MLC entity? Um, I'm generally aware of that. And that's a typical structure that is used by superannuation trustees as part of a group with a life insurance company? It's common for um, those sorts of arrangements to exist in retail trustees, yes, retail group trustees. And what it seems had occurred in relation to the My Super product was that the insurance company was then using another related party to manage the assets or the investment of the assets. And the insurance company was maintaining its profit at the expense of providing sufficient funds to the investment manager to be able to invest in unlisted assets. I don't have sufficient familiarity with the details of those arrangements to be able to respond to that. What I wonder is, is there any prospect that that would be something that APRA is interested in? Uh, yes, and, and, and indeed, as I indicated uh, a little while ago, as we become aware of new information about how arrangements are operating in practice, we will undertake activities to better understand that and, re and reassess our view as to whether there are any matters of concern. Um, and that is something that we do on an ongoing basis through our own supervision activity, but also monitoring what is happening more broadly uh, in, t in terms of uh, information that becomes available. But that ish, I understand you say you don't have sufficient information to be able to know about that issue. Assume it is as I have described it. What is it that APRA could do about it? The first step would be APRA would need to understand the actual details of the arrangements that you're referring to and form a view as to whether there were, were concerns and the degree of those concerns. And then we would again have to, to form a view about what the most appropriate action would be. It could be to 
um, engage with the trustee to get them to revisit and review those arrangements or um, it's very hard to make a general statement or response to that without having a complete understanding of the details. If the issue didn't present any risk to the stability of the fund and it didn't present any risk to the ability of the trustee to meet its financial promises to the members because the, the trustee isn't promising a high return on the basis of investment in unlisted assets. Would APRA have any interest in it? Yes, we would. Um, we um, have undertaken a lot of work, particularly recently, to understand the outcomes that are being delivered by trustees to members and whether those outcomes are reasonable and in the best interests of members over the medium to long term. And so if we felt that relative to alternative arrangements that could be in, in place, members were being particularly disadvantaged by a set of arrangements, then we would take an interest and we would look to seek uh, some form of uh, change to address the concerns. We go to page 26 of your statement. Yes. You have a chart in paragraph 172. Yes. Which illustrates that all my super single investment strategy products have met their return target in the four years to December 2017. Yes. But as we can see, there's a significant difference in what their return targets are. Yes. And as we understand it, almost invariably, the return target for a My Super Single Investment Strategy will be a CPI plus target. That's correct. And so CPI is, of course, common for everyone. That's not changing. So that just means that every one of these funds is selecting a different return target over CPI. Uh, yes. For a single diversified strategy. Uh, yes. Where? Relevant to the specific characteristics of the members, membership of their MySuper product. Where the balance will be between growth and defensive assets? In broad terms. And for the single diversified strategy, they're all going to be within a particular band of the split between growth and defensive assets? That's often the way these are described, but there's you know, obviously different um, ways in which asset portfolios are, are constructed within that for different reasons. People might for example, describe some, one entity might describe something as growth, which another entity might consider a defensive asset. Uh, yes. And so even just taking the split on its face might not necessarily tell you how comparable the two types of products are. That's correct. You need to look a little bit deeper than that, yes. And for a member of the public, it's impossible, isn't it, to look a little bit deeper at that? It's not impossible. Um, it does require them to um, seek further information than may be disclosed at a high level, yes. When it comes to the split between defensive and growth assets, is that something that APRA records and publishes? Uh, we, we do publish uh, information on the asset allocation of uh, my super products. We don't uh, typically group it just into growth and defensive. We actually uh, publish more granular asset classes, so, you know, uh, domestic and international equities, property, infrastructure, etc. And so if a member of a particular fund wanted to figure out how, how compare growth and defensive assets between two different funds, could they use that asset allocation information to do so? Uh, they could do so, although the primary purpose of APRA's publications is not necessarily for direct-to-consumer, it's for other industry stakeholders. I think the trustee needs to publish um, disclosure for members and there is information available through ASIC's uh, Money Smart website as well, I believe. But, uh, I mean, we, we do publish that information, but its primary purpose is not for individual members. So if members 
are setting out to compare the performance of to my super products. Do you agree the primary things they're going to be able to look at based on the dashboards that are published are the return achieved, the return target and the fees charged? They're the core elements of the dashboards, yes. And we understand the point you're making with this chart is the investment performance of my super to date is at least satisfactory, if not good, because the return target is hit. I, I think the general point I'm trying to make in this section of my statement is that in assessing the performance of tr trustees in delivering outcomes for members, you need to look at performance in a range of different ways, uh, not just in terms of peer performance, but also relative to return targets. Um, looking at net returns, um, expenses and a number of other dimensions. So this is just an illustration of a, a measure that can inform an assessment of performance, but it's not the only measure that would say that the trustee is, is delivering good outcomes for members. Let us take another example. Over the last few years, not for the single investment strategy product, but for the, well, also for the single investment strategy product, but for the life cycle stages that AMP has issued, it has been decreasing its target return. Are you aware of that? Not specifically, no. And that decrease in return happens at the level of investment manager and life insurance company and is then reported to the trustee. Is that, from APRA's perspective, an adequate arrangement? Ultimately, it is the trustee's responsibility to make the decision about the investment strategy and the return targets that underpin that strategy and whether that is appropriate. And if a trustee didn't have contractual rights to be able to refuse to accept that target or to insist that an investment manager have a different target, does that mean that there is a problem for the trustee? We would see that as, as unsatisfactory and, and not um, enabling the trustee to fulfil their obligations under the CIS Act. And if the trustee, even if it had contractual rights, there was no realistic prospect that it would ever step in to the relationship between the related parties, is that an inadequate situation from APRA's perspective? I would believe that would be the case. And in that case, would it mean that the trustee, from APRA's perspective, is not acting in the best interests of members? Again, it's, it's very hard to give a general, uh, a, a specific answer to a, a general set of circumstances. We, we would certainly uh, seek to understand the nature of the arrangement and the trustee's actions and um, whether there was a need for there to be a change in those to ensure that the trustee was acting in the best interests of members. Have there been situations in the last three years where APRA has formed the view that a, a trustee, the RSE licensee, is not acting in the best interests of members? I wouldn't say we have actually formed that view specifically. There have certainly been a number of um, uh, review work and situation, uh, situations in the last few years where we have looked at the practices and the arrangements of trustees and required changes to those arrangements and practices so that it, um, the trustee was um, acting in the best interests of members and addressing the concerns that we had identified. If APRA formed the view that a trustee was not acting in the best interests of members, what would its approach be to dealing with that problem? Again, that's a very broad question. Um, our process, in a nutshell, is, is fairly consistent. We seek to understand the issue. We then form a view of what the outcome is that we think might address the concern and then we seek to work with the trustee to achieve that outcome. 
which could be through our supervisory actions. It could be through um, requiring a special purpose investigation to which the trustee had to respond. It could ultimately be an exit from the industry or a, a change of trustee. And there are examples that we have provided of, of cases of those in our submissions to the Commission. Would it ever commence litigation? That is a potential um, action that we could take. Um, if we could not otherwise get the outcomes that we're, achieve, that we're seeking to achieve through getting changes to practice or even uh, negotiating an enforceable undertaking, for example. You know, one of the criticisms that has been made by the Productivity Commission in its draft report of APRA is that the behind closed doors nature of its activities is not effective for achieving what I will call general deterrence. That is an observation that has been made? By the Productivity Commission. By the Productivity Commission. Commission. And that's an observation that APRA disagrees with? We do disagree with that observation. Do you agree with the characterisation of your activities as behind closed doors? No. And do you agree with this proposition that what APRA does publicly does not identify specific conduct of specific entities? In general, that would be the case. Uh, the exception would be, for example, uh, enforceable undertakings which would ultimately become public, which do ultimately become public. Yes, but in the case of superannuation, no corporate trustee has been required to give an enforceable undertaking, at least in the last 10 years. Well, the TRIO uh, examples were 2013. That wasn't a corporate trustee. No. Those were individual Individuals. directors. Yes. So if we go back to my question, no corporate trustee has been required to give an enforceable undertaking in relation to superannuation in the last 10 years. That's correct. And in fact, I'm in total, how many corporate trustees have ever been required to give an enforceable undertaking I in relation know. to superannuation? I don't believe them. Not many. No. At most, a handful. Yes. So enforceable undertakings, if they were to occur, they would be public. Yes. But they don't occur. So what other public conduct does APRA engage in which would identify specific trustees and specific conduct of those trustees? None. However, we would say that deterrence is not only determined or a deterrence effect is not only achieved by disclosure of issues with individual entities. What is more important is to have the industry aware of the practices and issues that are of concern to APRA, the areas that we are focusing on and want to see changed and improved across the industry, um, and that that is widely communicated across the industry, and we do that through a number of ways. Such as the thematic reviews? Thematic review reports and letters, general industry letters on specific issues, um, speeches, industry engagement, inside articles and the like. And these things are directed, can I suggest, to trying to ensure the stability of the trustees and improve the stability of the trustees? No, that is not their only purpose. Um, our, our purpose is to ensure that the practices of the trustees operating in the superannuation industry are sound and um, delivering good outcomes to members over the long term. Do you agree with me that commencing public enforcement action would be destabilising for an individual trustee? There is a risk that uh, public action uh, against an individual trustee may cause reputation and other issues that would potentially make the problem that we were trying to address worse, um, which would be destabilising for uh, that trustee. But ultimately, the, the impact we would be concerned about would be the impact on the members of that fund. So the reason we take the behind the scenes approach is to try and get the address, issue addressed and if needs be, those members move to a different fund and entity 
without having that in the public domain and causing more adverse impact on those members. And the adverse impact on the members where there's public attention is what, from APRA's perspective? Well, typically what you would expect to occur um, if there was a, an issue raised in the public domain with a particular entity would be that that would cause members and employers that were participating in that ent entity to have concerns, review their arrangements, seek to withdraw their funds, which would then cause the realisation of assets in a, in a, a manner uh, that might create liquidity and asset valuation issues that would then ultimately damage the value of the trust and therefore lead to members getting less outcome, uh, less value for their, for their superannuation entitlements. Under the CIS Act, there's a time period within which a trustee is obliged to redeem a member's interest in the superannuation fund if they roll over to another fund? Uh, yes, generally speaking, there's a three-day time frame for that unless there are specific circumstances that warrant a longer time frame or they get dispensation for a different time period. And so the point you're making is if a substantial number of members of a fund reviewed their arrangements as a consequence of adverse publicity, they might all seek to switch to a better fund and that would be destabilising for the fund that is subject for the advert the subject of the adverse publicity. That's correct. And it's possible that ultimately that might result in worse member outcomes because the fund was illiquid or unable to sufficiently quickly liquidate its assets in order to move them to a different... Or you need to liquidate the assets at a value that is lower than their, their actual value. Yes. And that would be a concern for APRA? Yes. And it would be inconsistent with maintaining the stability of the system? It would also be inconsistent with delivering good outcomes for the members concerned. And is that consideration something that APRA takes into account or has taken into account in deciding whether to commence public enforcement action? Yes. And do you think that that is a consideration that other conduct regulators take into account in deciding whether to commence public <coughs> enforcement action? I don't think I'm able to speak on behalf of other conduct re regulators and their considerations. Well, one of, I'm sorry, I said other conduct regulators. I think, in fact, you very specifically make the point in your statement that you are not a conduct regulator, you are a prudential regulator. Yes. And you distinguish between those two types of regulators. Uh, to, to a degree. I mean, I think uh, there is an element of conduct regulation in all regulators because ultimately what is delivered in a prudential sense comes back to the behaviours and practices of the individuals that are running the entities. But prudential regulators typically do have concerns about uh, protecting the value of the assets and, the, um, yeah, and particularly when you're talking about pension trusts or superannuation trusts, that is a, a, a general concern of prudential regulators in undertaking their roles. I want to return to this topic but deal with something else first. In relation to the sole purpose test, that is a civil penalty provision under the CIS Act? Yes. That is something which APRA, in respect of which APRA could commence a civil penalty proceeding? Yes. APRA has never commenced a civil penalty proceeding in relation to the sole purpose test? No. And as we understand it from your statement, APRA hasn't seen a situation which it considers sufficiently clear to be a contravention of the sole purpose test? Or sufficiently, yes, yeah, serious enough to, to warrant that action or, or unable to be addressed in an alternate way. Do you know whether APRA has considered this question? If a trustee 
is automatically or regularly debiting money from members' accounts and paying it to advisors who are not providing a service to the members, is that consistent with the sole purpose test? I think I'd need to consider that more fully uh, to give a, a specific answer. I mean, we, we don't typically look specifically at uh, individual commission or other arrangements, but prima facie it would seem unsatisfactory from a member's perspective to be paying fees for which they're getting no service. Do you say it would be unsatisfactory? Unsatisfactory, yes. As you know, this has been an ongoing area of investigation for yes. ASIC. ASIC put out a report in October of 2016 <coughs> yes. raising what it called the fees for no service issue. Yes. You know that in many cases these fees were being deducted from superannuation accounts. Yes. Are you saying in the subsequent almost two year period APRA has never considered whether that might have contravened the sole purpose test? I'm not specifically saying that I'm uh, in that specific example we have been engaging and following ASIC's work in this area um, and ASIC is taking steps to address that issue and ensure that the relevant members are being appropriately remediated we are monitoring that and w we given that that work is in train we have not um, specifically uh, considered what further action, if any, by APRA may be needed. It's not to say we won't form that view, but at the moment ASIC is, is dealing with that matter and ensuring that members are being remediated, and so we do not want to intervene in, in ASIC's process. Is there a limitation period on commencing a civil penalty proceeding for a breach of the sole purpose test? I don't know. Is there some suggestion that you've had from ASIC that ASIC will commence public enforcement action in relation to fees for no service? I'm, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Is it satisfactory from the perspective of APRA as a matter of general deterrence that no proceeding has ever been commenced against a trustee on the basis of a contravention of the sole purpose test where the trustee is deducting mem money from members' accounts and paying it to related party advisors who are not providing a service? I think it's too early to form that conclusion because that work is ongoing and APRA has not made any final decisions about what action it may or may take uh, ultimately in relation to that matter. APRA's, re I'm sorry, ASIC's responsibility though is not for the sole purpose test and the trustees. Do you agree? I believe that's correct. APRA's response, I'm sorry, ASIC's responsibility is in relation to potential contraventions of the Corporations Act for the provision of financial advice or potential contraventions under the ASIC Act for retaining money for services for financial advice which aren't provided. I believe that's correct. APRA's responsibility is for regulating trustees' compliance with the sole purpose test. Yes. So it can't be that the management of this issue is something that should be left to ASIC. I am not suggesting that we are leaving it to ASIC. I am saying that we are allow, as, allowing ASIC to complete its work and review and um, ensure that the remediation occurs. At an appropriate point, APRA will consider whether there is any further action that we need to take. Is there some position that APRA has taken as to when in the future will be an appropriate point to consider this issue? Not at this stage, as far as I'm aware. So when you say APRA is waiting to see what ASIC will do, has there been any consideration at all within APRA in relation to this issue to date? Uh, <laughs> There's been discussions uh, with individual entities and um, uh, on the matter and seeking to get a complete understanding of the issues as they pertain to the individual entities. Um, uh, there would be general discussions occurring at APRA's internal committees about 
you know, what the issue was and what was being done to address it and, and those sorts of things. As I said, I don't believe that we have made any conclusions at this stage as to what uh, further action, if any, we might wish, wish to take. What about the question of the adequacy of trustee systems for monitoring whether advice services are provided in exchange for the fees that the trustees are debiting from the members' accounts. Is that something that APRA considers? APRA would look at um, a, a range of um, uh, systems and processes that trustees have in place to monitor particular arrangements. I am not sure that we would necessarily look specifically at um, advice arrangements. It may be something that we um, talk with some trustees about um, as part of our regular supervision activity. It wouldn't be something that we would necessarily look at in all cases. Do you have a view as to whether a trustee could be acting in the best interests of its members if it does not have adequate systems in place to monitor whether advice services have been provided in exchange for the fees that the trustee is debiting from the members' accounts? I, I think, as a general proposition, we would have concerns if a trustee didn't have appropriate monitoring arrangements in place for a, a, a number, in fact, all, all of the operations of the, of the trustee, of which that particular one would be, would be one. Can I suggest to you a particularly acute problem for a trustee in deducting, I'm sorry, a superannuation trustee in deducting money from members' accounts and paying it to financial advisors for financial advice is that the financial advice, financial advice must only relate to superannuation. Do you agree with that? Uh, again, it is important to understand um, what the nature of the advice arrangements are and where the costs for that advice are being borne as to where the boundaries are in relation to the sole purpose test and uh, in superannuation. I yes. think we're agreeing, but yes. let me just I think we are agreeing. go back. Because of the sole purpose test, a member's account can't be debited to pay for financial advice that doesn't relate to superannuation. I believe that's the case. And so for a trustee who is properly complying or seeking to comply with the sole purpose test, they need to have systems in place, don't they, to make sure that the fees that are debited are being provided for advice related to superannuation? Yes. And so it would be a point of concern, presumably for APRA, if they didn't have adequate systems in place to do that? Yes. And if they were deducting money from members' accounts and paying it to advisors who were not providing any services, that would show very clearly that they don't have adequate systems in place. Following all those assumptions, I guess that would be the case. Again, we would need to look at the specifics, yes. But we know the last thing is happening. Do you agree? or has happened? I understand so, yes. And I'm just trying to understand whether APRA has taken any active steps to try to deal with the relevant trustees about their conduct insofar as it might breach the sole purpose test or about their future behaviour insofar as it might concern the way in which they're carrying out monitoring in the future. So as I said earlier, the Supervisors that have responsibility for the individual entities that have been identified through ASIC's work have been engaging with those institutions to understand the nature and extent of the issues and how the trustee and the group, as relevant, are responding to those issues that have been raised by ASIC. Right, so you, as you understand it, the supervisors are dealing with and taking those issues up with ASIC? On an entity-by-entity -entity basis. We go to paragraph 239 of your statement, which is on page 36. Yes. 
this is a paragraph that relates to a paper that is either finalised or not finalised that APRA and ASIC are drafting. Yes. Is it finalised? It was finalised on the 3rd of August. All right. Has it been published on APRA and ASIC's website? Yes. And I think you haven't exhibited the paper, but it has been exhibited by Mr Kell. Yes. And I'll just bring that up. Can we bring up ASIC.0880.0011.3343? Was it published on your websites? I believe it was on the 3rd of August. It's exhibit PK7 to Mr Kell's statement. <coughs> so this is Would it help if I said the document ID again? It's ASIC.0800.0011.3343. Did you know when you signed your statement on the 3rd of August <coughs> that it had been finalised? Uh, no, I knew it was in the process of being finalised, but it wasn't clear that it was actually going to be finalised on that day and published on that day. Thank you. So this is the statement? Yes. And the purpose of it, as we understand it, is to try to clarify the respective roles of ASIC and APRA in relation to the regulation of superannuation? That was the intent. And the essence of it seems to be those first two bullet points there. APRA is primarily responsible for ensuring RSE licensees prudently manage their business operations in a manner consistent with their member best interest obligations and the delivery of quality member outcomes. Yes and ASIC is primarily responsible for ensuring RSE licensees meet their conduct obligations in their dealings with consumers, including disclosure and advice to members and ensuring members have access to complaints processes. Yes. And this distinction of roles between APRA being responsible for prudently managing or ensuring licensees prudently manage their business businesses and ASIC being responsible for RSEs meeting their conduct obligations. Is that a distinction that you think accurately reflects the roles of the two regulators? In broad terms, I, th I think we're, our primary focus is on the overall operations of the trustee and the RSEs under their oversight and the, and the members as a whole or, or equity between groups of members, whereas ASIC uh, is more focused on the re specific relationship between the trustees and uh, individual consumers. Where the CIS Act contains conduct obligations, who is responsible for enforcing those? You need to look at the specific allocation of responsibilities. Uh, I think it's in section six of the CIS Act as to which particular provisions of the Act are um, the responsibilities of the specific regulators. Does this document help the public to understand 
that, that is, which regulator is responsible for the conduct obligations under the CIS Act? The, the purpose of the document is to try and, if you like, provide a more plain English uh, summary of those responsibilities rather than to be a, a detailed and accurate documentation of those specific responsibilities. But we would uh, think that the commentary in the, in the document and the supporting table about the different aspects of operations and which regulator would um, have primary carriage in each area is uh, intended to help with understanding those different obligations. If we go to attachment A to the document, which is page dot three three four seven. So this is setting out the different aspects of the regulatory responsibilities. That's correct. And do you have a hard copy of that document? I don't. Mrs. No. Rao? Can we get a hard copy for her? Sorry. So if you go to the back of the document, it should yes, have the attachment. The table. Thank you, yes. Mr. Trow. I just wanted you to help us understand, as this is going through the responsibilities, Yes. does it identify who is responsible for ensuring that the trustee acts in the best interests of members? The table itself probably doesn't explicitly address that point. I think the, uh, the summary at the beginning does. The summary being the that it's APRA, is that right? Yes. And it's APRA insofar as APRA is concerned with the trustee prudently, prudently managing their business operations. That's correct. Although I think there would be potentially an indirect best interest uh, obligation uh, that may arise from some of the areas uh, that are ASIC's responsibility, for example, uh, in relation to poor disclosure or the like, that would ultimately end up being not in the best interest of members, arguably. And if there was conduct that a trustee engaged in that was not in the best interests of members, that would be whose responsibility? It, generally speaking, it would be APRA's unless it related to specific matters such as disclosure or advice or other elements which are under ASIC's responsibility. And does the document attempting to explain the division of responsibilities explain that? I think the document is saying if you look at the the, the way or the activities of the trustee um, or the, the aspects of the operation of the trustee, it tries to summarise where the responsibility for those particular aspects sit. I see. And so taking from that, if there was an issue that arose in any of those particular areas, it tells you who the relevant regulatory agency would be. You're aware that some evidence was given during the course of this week of the hearings concerning ASIC's engage, I'm sorry, concerning APRA's engagement with Colonial about compliance with section 29 capital W capital A uh, yes. of the CIS Act. Yes. And 29 WA is an, or contravention of 29 WA is an offence. Yes. And it's an offence of strict liability. Yes. And for an offence or for a contravention of section 29 WA, if that was to be prosecuted, how would it be prosecuted? Um, we would need to apply to the court, I believe, to issue an infringement notice or to get the court to, to take action, I believe. I'm not 100% I'm not sure. It's never happened that APRA has pursued a contravention of 29 WA? No. 
apart from Colonial, were there any other entities that contravened 29 WA? I believe there may have been some uh, more minor issues uh, that involved Section 29 WA, but I don't have the details. The most significant one was with Colonial? I believe so, but I'm not sure. And the issue, as we understand it, is that Colonial, between 1 January 2014 and mid-April 2014, contravened 29 WA at least 15,000 times. So the issue was that um, as, uh, from 1 January 2014, uh, contributions, default contributions needed to be paid into a My Super product. There was a particular division of the colonial uh, RSE uh, in which members typically made irregular contributions, their personal plan, those, uh, there was no My Super product in that plan, so when contributions were received in respect of those members after 1 January 2014, default contributions, then there was a potential contravention of that provision of the Act. But when you say potential contravention... There was a It's a contravention, contravention, isn't it? Yes. And APRA had warned entities in advance of 1 January 2014 <coughs> that they had to pay new default contributions into a My Super product? There was a reminder letter sent in November 2013. And APRA's view was a trustee acting properly and in compliance <coughs> with its legal obligations would put in place systems to pay default contributions into a My Super product after 1 January 2014? Yes, that was the expectation. And Colonial notified APRA that it hadn't done that? Yes. And there were 15,000 members who received default contributions not into a My Super product just in that first three and a half month period of 2014. That's correct. And then after that, through until 2016 at least, Colonial continued to contravene the section. There were smaller groups of members that, uh, for which contributions were received. Every few months, mm. there would be new members yes. who would have contributions. Yes. Is it the case that every contribution, so every time a contribution is received into the fund that is a default contribution and not paid into a My Super product is a contravention of 29 WA? I believe that would be how the law was to be interpreted, yes. So when we talk about 15,000 contraventions, that assumes... It may be members, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, you think it might be members? Yeah. Or I'm not sure. So in any event, though, there were 15,000 members who received we don't know how many contributions just in that first three-and-a-half-month period? Um, yes, and I think they would be probably um, employer contributions for those members. That's right. it, they would have to be employer contributions if they're default contributions. Yes. yes. And then every few months after that, Colonial would give APRA an update to say there have been some more members where there have been contraventions. So we agreed a remediation process with Colonial after the first uh, notification of the breach as to the process that would be used to address those uh, breaches to ensure that the members were put into the right uh, option, be it a default option or a choice investment option, as quickly as possible, and that any uh, differential in fee was remediated uh, within a short time period, uh, whilst CFS took steps to establish the appropriate My Super product in the in the personal van or find a way to address that issue. If we bring up. CBA.0001.0451.0184. So this is the letter sent on the 14th of March 2014 by APRA to Colonial. Yes. And then if we go over to page two.
we see what yep. APRA put forward as an appropriate course would be that contributions received after 1 January 2014 without an investment direction being allocated into a My Super product or Colonial receiving a valid contribution investment direction from an affected member? Yes. And was APRA encouraging Colonial to seek out investment directions? I don't know that we were encouraging that. I think we were just setting out the alternative ways in which the uh, breach could be rectified. And then you see the second paragraph, oh, I'm sorry, the next paragraph, whichever solution or combination of solutions is adopted, APRA expects rectification to be completed in the short term. Yes. And ultimately, when did APRA determine that the issue was closed? I'm not sure. I can probably help. If we bring up exhibit on the other side of the screen, 5.195. It's cba.0001.0451.2600. So this is a response from APRA on the 21st of September 2017, where you'll see yes. the response is, we have no further queries and consider this item closed. I can see that. But that's about three and a half years after APRA sent its letter to Ms Elkins on the 14th of March 2014. Yes, although I understand that the actual final payment, if you look further down that email, uh, occurred in July 2017. Still a period after, yes. Three and a quarter years. Yes. And is that, from APRA's perspective, rectification completed in the short term? I think what we were satisfied with was that the process that was dealt with each set of contributions and each member as they occurred was dealt with within a relatively short period, which I understand was less than six months. So a, a period to um, seek a direction for the member. If the direction was received, then the contribution went uh, to the investment choice nominated. If the direction was not received, then they went into an appropriate default product and there was again an adjustment made for the differential in fees in that intervening period. That is, you start the clock ticking for the six months from when the first offence occurs in respect of that member. I, I believe that was the process that was agreed at the time. And was there an agreement by APRA that it wouldn't take any enforcement action in respect of these contraventions? <coughs> I'm not sure that I would say that that was necessarily an, uh, an explicit agreement. I think what APRA agreed with CFS was an appropriate way to deal with the issue in a manner that achieved an appropriate outcome for the members that were impacted. You see the next sentence on the page says, failure to rectify the breach satisfactorily may result in APRA taking enforcement action. Yes. So do we take it this was a satisfactory resolution of the breach? I think ultimately APRA um, agreed an appropriate process um, and was satisfied that the process had been followed. Now, one of the things that APRA had suggested after these initial 15,000 contraventions was that the ADA transition for the other roughly 60,000 members of the first choice personal super product over to a my super product be accelerated i believe that was raised with them yes it wasn't just raised apra said this is what you should do i wasn't involved in the specific communications and 
one of the reasons that APRA wanted that to occur was that that would then prevent further offences being committed. Yes, that would be the case. But Colonial said no. Colonial communicated a number of issues that would need to be resolved to expedite the transfer. And you know one of the things that Colonial said was we now have processes in place that will prevent any further contraventions of 29 WA. Um, is that something that was communicated to us or are you basing you. that on the... I'm not you. We can, I can bring familiar it up. with all of the communications between APRA and CFS. Can we bring up CBA.0001.0451.0267, that's Exhibit 5.198? So this is an email from Colonial to APRA where it's being explained that the board, after careful consideration, did not approve bringing it forward and the third bullet point is the low probability of breaching section 29 WA in the future given the controls now in place. I see that, yes. But in fact, it did keep breaching it. That would appear to be the case, yes. And kept breaching it through into at least August of 2016. Yes. And in respect of any of those further contraventions, do you know why APRA didn't take any enforcement action? I would, uh, not specifically, but I would assume that it was on the same basis that the, as soon as it was identified, the members were dealt with appropriately and the process that had been agreed with CFS to deal with those um, breaches had been implemented within the agreed timeframes. Just on the members being dealt with appropriately, I'm sorry, Commissioner, I should tender the one email that hasn't gone into evidence. That was cba.0001.0451.0184. That's the letter to Ms Elkins dated the 14th of March 2014 from APRA. Letter APRA to CFSIL uh, of 14 March 14 becomes exhibit 5.299. The ID is CBA 0001 0451 Can we then bring up? CBA.0001.0451.0310. <coughs> you may not be able to help us with this, Mrs. Rao. This is the letter from Ernst and Young concerning remediation by Colonial. Have I've you ever looked at this before? No, I have not. Okay. You made a comment before, though, about the remediation being based on the difference in fees between the ADA product and the MySuper product? That's based on an, a summary update that I've received in the last few days in preparing for this hearing. All right. I will just tender that document, Commissioner, rather than asking Mrs Rowell about it. Letter EY to CFSIL, 13 October 14, CBA 0001 0451-0310, Exhibit 5.300. Now, you know that the documents that CBA provided to APRA included the call script and letter that it proposed to use? I believe so. Have you reviewed that call script and letter in the course of preparing to give evidence today? No, I have not. You haven't looked at it? No. Can we bring up exhibit 5.189, which is CBA.0001.0451.0217?
So this is an email that was sent by Colonial to an employee at APRA, and you'll see it attaches the final version of the member communication that's proposed to be used. Is that over the page? And we can bring that up then if we bring up CBA.0001.0451.0218. So this is the standard form letter that's going to be sent out to members. Yes. And you see what the members are going to be told in the second paragraph is there has been a recent change to superannuation legislation which requires us to hold an investment direction from you in relation to future contributions paid into first choice personal super. If a direction is not held by us, we are unable to accept contributions into your account. For this reason, we would like you to confirm the investment options into which you would like your contributions to be paid. Yes. Now, what I want to suggest to you is this letter is going to mislead the recipients into thinking that they need to give an investment direction. To be a member of this, to remain a member and to have their contributions credited to this particular product would mean that they needed to give an investment choice direction. Yes, what the letter doesn't explain, can I suggest, is that if there's no investment direction, then what Colonial is required to do is to pay their contributions into a My Super product. Well, that is not in that paragraph. I have not seen the full letter. I don't know that if there's more to it. You can assume there's no more to it. Do you know whether somebody within APRA would have reviewed this correspondence before saying that it was okay? My understanding is that it was considered internally by APRA at the time. It was considered? I believe so. And considered to be acceptable? Uh, my understanding is that the case, but I was not involved in those discussions. And was the call script also considered? I believe the call script was provided. And APRA would have also satisfied itself that the call script was acceptable? I, I believe it was looked at. As I said, I was not involved at the time. Is it acceptable from a APRA's perspective that Colonial would be making misleading statements to members in order to obtain an investment direction, which would then lead to them no longer contravening 29 capital W, capital A? Making misleading uh, statements would be unacceptable. I, I don't have enough information to know whether that is the case here or not. I think certainly complete, more complete com com communication to the members would have been desirable. I, I take it that in the last few days, as you've received briefings about the Royal Commission, nobody has told you or given you any detail about the evidence that was given by Colonial in this respect? I've had high level updates on it, but not in depth detail. Have you been told about Ms Elkin's evidence in respect of the call script and letter? I have had updates on some of that evidence. Have you been told that Ms Elkins acknowledged that some of the statements were misleading? I'm aware that's what was indicated. Have you been told why it is if the statements are misleading, APRA approved them? I was provided with some general updates as to the context in which this issue occurred and how APRA dealt with it. Have you inquired as to why APRA would have approved these call script and letter if they were misleading? Given that this arose in the last few days, I have not had the opportunity to require, a, expect a detailed briefing on that, no. Is that something you're going to inquire into? I, there is no doubt that these matters are under discussion with, within APRA. Can I perhaps just... <coughs> and those discussions could not be brought to an end before you came into the witness box to give evidence. Is that the position? That's correct. Hmm? Can we bring up the call script, 
which is Exhibit 5.203 CBA.0001.0479.0817. Now this, actually this is a different call script. This is a call script for a later call out campaign. But nevertheless, let me ask you about this one while we find the other one. So this is a guide being given to call centre staff at CBA. You see the background is changes to super legislation require us to hold an investment direction from all of our clients about how they want their super invested. If we don't have this information, this account balance is defined as an accrued default amount and we have to transfer this balance to a My Super product. I can see that what it is what it says, yes. And then you see what is success, contacting client, letting them know that a change is coming to their super, which may result in an increase to their ongoing annual fees, costs and insurance premiums. I can see those words, yes. They need to be aware that they can opt out of this transfer and avoid an increase in fees and premiums if they confirm their investment direction with us. Yes, I can see that. And then if we go over the page, You see what the call centre staff member is going to say is there has been a legislative change which means that some or all of your first choice employer super account balance will be transferred to the life stage investment option later this year. If this transfer proceeds, your ongoing fees and costs may increase. Yes. Was it APRA's understanding at any time that trustees were taking, I'm sorry, I should withdraw that, retail trustees were taking <laughs> active steps to try to obtain investment directions rather than have ADAs transition over to my super products? Uh, we were aware that was occurring. That was, in essence, uh, part of the transition process from uh, the previous uh, legislative uh, provisions to the implementation of my super was that the transition process was to allow the um, entities to, um, where it wasn't, particularly where it wasn't clear as to whether a member had made a specific investment choice or not, to communicate with those members, tell them about what the changes were and get them to either uh, make a specific investment choice or move to a default product. Was APRA aware that in general ADAs would have commissions embedded into them, whereas my super products have no commissions? I'm not sure that we necessarily um, were aware of that at the time. Is, is APRA aware of that now? Uh, our under uh, Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Is APRA aware that I'll frame it more generally. Many ADAs have commissions embedded into them. I'm, I'm not sure that I have an understanding of the extent to which that is the case. Did APRA have any understanding as to whether it would be in the financial interests of the retail trustees to keep members in ADAs rather than having them move to the My Super product? I think given the differences between the product structures and fees, um, it is there are differences in fee structures and, and terms and conditions between the products, which mean that it, typically fees are higher in choice products than default products. So that would be in the retail RSEs, um, they would get more fees for having members in choice products. So the answer to my question is yes, it would be in the interests of the retail trustees to keep members in ADAs rather than moving them to my super products. Yes, but the conclusion from that is not necessarily that that's not in members' best interests. To pay higher fees yes. with commissions? Yes. 
does APRA have a view as to whether the payment of commissions is in the best interests of members? I think you need to look at that issue in the context of the overall products and, and um, features and terms and conditions and what the member is getting in that context to form a view about that. You can't look at line items in a, a, a product or an option individually to form that view. What can a member possibly get for a commission? <coughs> It's the nature of the, st the structure of those products that were established. It was part of the distribution mechanism and the overall cost base of the, of the product. So it was something in a choice context that the members understood at the time. Um, and so you need to look at it in that, in that wider context to form a view. Well, they weren't choice members when they went into the ADA products, were they? Uh, some were, some weren't. I, Understand. By definition, they can't have been because an ADA is a default product where no investment direction has been given. I, I think part of the issue that existed at the time of that transition was that it, it wasn't necessarily clear as to the, the nature of the, the members that were in what were called accrued de, um, default amounts as to whether they had actually made a choice in being put into those products. If they hadn't given an investment direction, they were in an ADA. Yes, but there was some work needed by the retail trustees at the time to determine whether members had in fact given investment directions. They could only be in an ADA, or they could only be deemed to be invested in an ADA if they hadn't given an investment direction? Ultimately, that was the, yes. To return to the commission issue, just so I understand what you were saying, you were saying it might be possible that it remains in the members' interests to continue to have a commission deducted from their account and paid to a financial advisor where there's no obligation on the part of the financial advisor to provide an ongoing service to the member? Commissions were originally um, about the distribution of the product and were structured at the time as part of the embedded costs and, and features of those products. And if you were transferring that product, then those features would, would continue. And I think you'd need to do more analysis to assess whether there was any uh, member interest issue there. You can't look at that in isolation. Do you mean you need to compare the overall value of the ADA product with the MySuper product? Yes. And therefore then conclude as to whether or not the member is better off going to the MySuper product? Yes. And so if the member is paying lower fees to go to a product with a similar investment strategy, is there a way in which that could nevertheless not be in the interests of the member? There's too many negatives in that question for me. Can you just repeat that again for me, please? If the member is going to pay lower fees on going into the My Super product with a similar investment strategy to the ADA product, is there still some way in which you think that might not be in the best interest of the member? Uh, it's hard to say in the specifics of the case. And again, you need to look at the overall um, structure of the arrangements and best interest needs to be assessed um, at a range of levels for the RSE as a whole, for different cohorts of members within, within the, uh, the RSE um, and, and form an overall view, part of which is net returns, costs and other features, but it's also about the ongoing viability and sustainability of the RSE itself. Did APRA have a concern from 1 July 2000, at any time from 1 July 2014, about whether retail RSE licensees were acting in their own financial interests when they communicated to members who were in ADAs in order to obtain an investment direction from those members? 
my understanding of the process that was undertaken by the supervisors at the time was that they were engaging with each of the entities under their, um, that they were supervising to understand the nature of the arrangements and what processes were being undertaken. I am not in a position to know whether there were any specific concerns that we had at that time. Has there been any general project undertaken by APRA to evaluate whether <coughs> retail RSE licensees acted in their own financial interests in relation to the transfer of ADAs to my super products? No, there has not. Has there been any concern internally at a general level for APRA as to whether retail RSE licensees acted in their own financial interests in relation to the transfer of ADAs to my super? I, I, I don't believe so. I think as a general proposition, APRA does have concerns about the management and oversight of related party arrangements generally uh, within the retail sector and the uh, not-for-profit sector and seek to understand those and whether trustees are exercising their um, uh, decision making in the best interests of members. I'm not sure that we have specifically focused on the ADA process as, as part of that consideration. We've looked at a range of different arrangements um, in terms of related party arrangements. Can we bring up, we've found the right exhibit now, exhibit 5.187, which is CBA.0001.0451.0204. So this is the call script that was to be used for that first, at this time it was only 14,000, it then turned out it was 15,000 members who are members of First Choice Personal Super, where there were default contributions being paid into their account after 1 January 2014. Uh, you haven't seen this document no, before? No, I haven't. Let me ask you this. Do you see in the middle of the page that the script says, we have been receiving contributions into your account and they are currently being invested into the, whatever the investment option is. Yes. There has been a recent change to legislation which requires us to confirm the investment options into which you would like your superannuation contributions paid. Would you like me to complete this now on your behalf over the phone? I can see that. Do you agree that on its face that is misleading? I agree that it doesn't um, provide complete information to the member to enable them to make their choice or decision. And is that an acceptable outcome from APRA's perspective? It's not desirable, or I would say. It's not desirable? Surely it's unacceptable from a regulator's perspective? It would be preferable if there was complete disclosure to the members. I don't have any further questions to this witness. Mrs. Rowell, uh, you've spoken of APRA uh, supervising the work of trustees. A part of that work, I understand, to be to see whether trustees are asking the right questions of other entities in the business of which they form part. Is that right? That's correct. And APRA has no uh, uh, capacity to go and interrogate uh, other parts of the entities uh, other than the trustee, does it? Uh, we, we can do so through our outsourcing standard. We um, have the ability to uh, engage with the material providers of services to the trustee. And routinely do? We do. Yes. The trustee asking the right questions is uh, one thing. Uh, if the flow of information to the trustee is controlled uh, by uh, other parts of the business, how can the trustee know what question to ask? I think it's 
um, a practical reality that a lot of the information that comes to the trustee necessarily comes from their service providers and in a retail group they would be related party service providers. I don't think that means that the trustee can't therefore ask for different information or more information or um, obtain information from other parties or require independent review of the information that is provided to them in order to, to form uh, and make better decisions. Indeed, our expectation, excuse me, Commissioner, no, would, would be that, that trustees would take some of those steps to satisfy themselves that they were getting the right information and asking the right questions. And how can APRA form any judgment about whether the trustee is doing its job properly? through our supervision activities and our engagement with the, the trustee and um, other parties within the operations of the trustee itself and their material service providers, and also through our review of the information that the trustee itself is looking at and our assessment as to whether that is adequate and, comp and sufficient to enable them to fulfil their duties. Yeah. Is there anything arising, Mr Hodge? No, Commissioner, although I would just like to follow on with one other question in yeah. my, or one other set of questions. Could we bring up paragraph 253 of Mrs. Rowell's statement? That's on page 38. Yes. So in this paragraph, you're expressing the position of APRA, which is it strongly supports certain amendments which are going to expand APRA's powers to be able to give directions to trustees? That's correct. And it will be possible if the bill pass, passes for APRA to direct trustees to make changes to the systems, business practices or operation? That's correct. And indeed in subparagraph G, to do or refrain from doing anything else in relation to the affairs of the licensee, the funds for which that licensee is the trustee or any subsidiary? Yes. And one of the things that that would seemingly permit APRA to do would be to direct a trustee to merge the fund with another trustee? Uh, that would be a possible use of that power, yes. Is it likely that APRA would ever actually do that? Uh, you couldn't rule it out. Yes, we would do that. One of the challenges with taking any significant action or making any significant direction like that would be presumably be the likelihood that it would be subject to challenge in court. Uh, that, that is always possible. And for something like that, the likelihood that one of the trustees at least would bring a review application in the federal court or in the administrative appeals tribunal would be quite high. That's possible, I, hard to judge the likelihood. And would it be the case that APRA in deciding whether to exercise this power would have to consider the likelihood of court challenge? Uh, I mean, that would be a consideration. The primary consideration would be whether the merger was in the best interests of members and the issues at play and the particular seriousness of the issues that were wanting us to direct the merger to occur as to how we would weigh up those, those different considerations. There have been some mergers that have fallen, almost occurred but fallen over in the last few years. Yes. For example, the potential merger between Equip Super and Energy Super? Yes. And the potential merger between Equip Super and Vision Super? Uh, yes. And APRA has reviewed those cases? Um, we're aware of those cases, yes. So it has... Has engaged with the relevant trustees to understand the rationale for those decisions. And formed a view that the decisions were not unreasonable? I'm not sure we, I'd characterise it that way. I think when we look at a merger and the assessment that the trustees have made, we want to, uh, part of the consideration is the, the, the viability and the outcomes being delivered by the trustees separately as, uh, and whether there is any concerns that we would have that would suggest that there was a need or an imperative for a merger to occur. That wasn't the case in either of those uh, situations as I understand it.
is one of the other things that APRA could conceivably do under these powers if it had them be to direct a trustee to unwind some particular structure that it had in place? Uh, that would be a potential use of those directions, yes. For example, it might be able to direct an entity which was both the trustee of a superannuation fund and also the responsible entity of a managed investment scheme to unwind that arrangement? Yes. And is that something that, in your view, APRA might consider doing if it had these powers? Yes. And that t particular type of structure known as a DRE structure, is that a structure of particular concern to APRA? It is an, a structure which, in our view, raises a number of uh, issues around conflicts management that are difficult to effectively manage, and hence that does create concerns. Um, and indeed, we have actually uh, achieved changes in other DRE structures in the past where we were uncomfortable with or unhappy with the management of conflicts and got, got that separation to occur. It was the structure of TRIO, was it? I uh, know there have been other examples as well. No, no, no but it was the structure it of TRIO. It was the structure of TRIO, yes. And you're making the point that with some other entities, you've been able to persuade them to unwind that structure. That's correct. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. No, nothing uh, in re-examination, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs Rowell. You may step down and you're excused.